Hi Christian, thanks so much for coming to talk to us. Okay. Um, just to start with, uh, can you give us a brief overview of what you do and how you came about doing it? My profession as such is as a device specialist, so focusing on pacemakers and ICDs. Um, and I work in the NHS doing that and that's my bread and butter job. Okay. And um, I guess why you guys might be interested in me is that I have quite a large online presence with regards to patient information and uh, educating the masses of people out there who may, might have pacemakers mm -hmm. or are medical professionals that want to know more about pacemakers. So it started with a patient audience and has grown into a bit more of a medical audience as well? It did actually. I thought the information I was putting out there was for patients but it's been quite well received by uh, the medical professionals as well who perhaps have gaps in their knowledge um, and it gives them a nice opportunity, a nice mechanism to fill those. Mm -hmm. And that's grown into a book? One day, um, as a medical professional, as we all do, even though we might not admit to it sometimes, <laughs> is that I had a question in clinic and I thought I'll check Google <laughs> to find the answer. And I went on Google and I was actually uh, presented with a lot of information and I started to filter through some of it and found that there was a lot of inaccurate information online, which uh, I guess did concern me a little bit. Um, you know, with pacemaker operations being compared to having your ears pierced or, you know, pacemakers um, knowing when people's time has come so they switch themselves off. There's a whole kind of uh, range of inaccuracies online. And uh, it was the inaccuracies that worried me and I felt, do you know what, I have a professional responsibility to put more accurate information out there. Mm -hmm. So I found myself on these websites um, starting to comment and say, uh, that is good information. Um, actually just to drill into it a little bit further you'll find that this is true or even commenting on the point saying that's completely inaccurate and um, this is the actual truth um, because I want as a healthcare professional you want patients to have a sound mind as well as obviously sound physical health and uh, knowledge and correct information is very much part of that so I started to reply to all these online sites and then I felt well actually uh, to give myself m a better platform and a better mechanism or a better channel to do it, I should probably have my own website. Mm -hmm. So I created a blog. Uh, the response has been just phenomenal from, um, in so many different ways, from a patient perspective. They really are appreciative of somebody, um, a healthcare professional, basically taking the time to engage with them on a more personal level. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I find it a nice medium to put a bit more of my personality across. Uh, you have to be a little less professional sometimes you might within your other working environments. But also just to have those conversations with people who are struggling with concepts, who have left their appointment, left their visit to the hospital without all their questions answered. They get home and they think, oh, do you know what, why did I forget to answer that? And uh, through this channel, through my website, they're able to quickly post a question and I can either point them in the right direction or answer the question myself very quickly. So it's quite nice to appease people or just put their minds at rest with such a simple platform. Mm -hmm. So traditionally doctors have been ushered away from engaging with patients online. Do you see this as a new trend and something that's going to take a grip? Uh, yes, and I guess we haven't covered it yet, but we should probably cover it that the pad is written under Carl Robinson, who oh, was yeah. my pen name or pseudonym, whatever you want to call it. And the reason I created Carl was, I guess, as a bit of protection for myself. At the time, I felt very much that I was walking into the abyss. I didn't know what kind of worms I was opening. And uh, so in order to keep it separate from my professional career, which I felt was advisable at the time, and now I realise that actually <laughs> they can benefit one another, so I shouldn't do that. And also just to create an extra layer of protection between um, you know, patients and myself interacting mm -hmm. online. Um, away from what I do in my uh, other career, if you like, with the NHS. Yeah. yeah so it's a protection mechanism. Um, but now, looking back, I wish I hadn't because I've realised that all my concerns were unfounded. Um, it was just the unknown that was concerning me. 
So it's something you would passionately advocate, more doctors get online. I am passionate about it and I've become very frustrated um, for so many reasons that being online can do so many things for you. And I think threefold really. It can embellish your career. I've progressed very quickly in the last two years. Uh, I think that is solely down to the fact that I'm online and it makes me unique amongst my peers. So when I'm going for job interviews or when I'm being um, viewed by people in the same profession, they think, well, you know, this guy's got a website, he's online, um, maybe he's more reputable than other people because that's how we're programmed to think. Um, I've had countless opportunities working abroad, um, working with yourselves today, I've written books, you know, so many things come of it. And then we have the, the selfless aspect, which I feel we have a real um, professional responsibility to make sure that the information out there is correct. And it's given me a real platform to address things in um, media or the public eye, which might be inaccurate, that I can then um, put to bed. For example, um, there was a story recently run in the Daily Mail about 40 pacemakers. And um, there's that saying that there's um, lies, damn lies, and statistics, <laughs> and it's so true. So they've managed to manipulate statistics to say that I think 20,000 deaths or something similar could be put down to pacemakers each year in the UK. Well, actually, if you looked at the journal and if you looked at the study, out of the um, population of patients that they reviewed, only seven had a pacemaker. And they'd use the information from those seven patients to quantify for the entire um, population of the country, which of course is ludicrous. So the website gave me a really nice platform um, to put people's minds at rest and redress that and actually put forward a more reasoned argument um, to the findings of the study. So would you work with a pharma company in an educational capacity? And what do you imagine that kind of looking like? So, as I said, it's everybody's responsibility. So I'd be willing to work with anyone in the medical industry that wanted to get a message across. And again, I believe that responsibility forms, falls with doctors and pharma companies as well. So no one knows their product, I guess, like pharma companies do. So they obviously have a responsibility to start to educate, you know, not only to the patients that are already on their drugs, but potentially to patients that are looking at their options. So very much so is it their responsibility, and I think they could be better at how they go about it. What I would say is there's the other side of the coin, whereas whether you think it's morally correct or not, you know, patients are becoming more powerful. There's patient empowerment going along all the time. From a device's point of view, I know that in America, for example, patients have input into the manufacturer whose pacemaker they get. They can say, well, actually, I've heard good things about this device or this device. Would it be possible if I could have one of those? You know, my friend's got this device and they love it. And they do have a say in a, the devices they get because a lot of the devices are quite similar in what they do. So there's not a huge clinical difference between them. But the patient knowing that they've got their device of preference has quite a big um, you know, effect on them mentally uh, with regards to their health. So if you were looking from a pharma company point of view, I'm sure that that traverses to that side as well, where if a patient knows more about their company, their drug, the availability, the side effects, the way it could help them, then it will potentially feed back from patient empowerment and increase sales. So from a pharma point of view, if I was head of a pharma company, which I'm not, unfortunately, um, I think very much twofold. You have a responsibility to educate people, like I said, we all have, and at the same time, it could be you know mutually beneficial to their to their product as well, to their turnover. So I think it's a no-brainer. But um, again, I think I'd really be more comfortable if the real driving kind of point behind this talk was that morally, I really do think we have a responsibility to get good information out there to our patients. Because a lot of the time they're leaving clinic, they're leaving the healthcare centre without all the information that they need. In terms of engaging with patients online, what's your golden rules? <laughs> good question. So my golden rules are never get drawn into a conversation directly about their health. Uh, obviously you don't know their full medical background, you don't know that the information they're giving you is accurate. Um, and you also don't know how powerful the things or advice you're giving them or saying might be in their world. 
so you have to be quite careful. My rules would be, I always feel confident just talking about the science of what's going on. So obviously being a pacemaker specialist, if people say, um, do you know what, I, I don't feel like when I exercise that my heart rate increases enough, do you think they should turn my rate response on, which is something in a pacemaker that will increase your heart rate when you exercise. And I'll never say, yeah, you should totally get that switched on. That <laughs> sounds like a great idea. Um, instead, I'll say, well, that's really for a decision for you to make with your healthcare professional, whatever avenue or form that takes. This is how rate response works, though. So there's a crystal inside some pacemakers, and when it vibrates, it knows that you're exercising or it intuitively thinks that you're exercising and will increase your heart rate. So I've had the conversation with them and helped to educate them, but I haven't been drawn into a, a, a medical two-way conversation about their health. So that's my golden rule, is basically, <laughs> don't get drawn into a conversation about their health directly, but at the same time, don't be afraid to share with them information just about um, the kind of topic or concept that they're inquiring. Personally, when I started going online, didn't really have a framework for how it might work. And a lot of people that I speak to, especially about social media, is about how they could go about starting to interact with their audience. And essentially, I think that there's a really nice framework, the three C's, which is curation, creation, and comment. What that means is that if a patient or another healthcare professional has written something online, you could comment on it. So just join in the conversation and start to open up a discussion with them. You can create content, so share some value with them, maybe information about a disease process, a support group, you know, give your kind of viewer or your reader something of value. And the other thing is curation. So curation is really important and all it is is taking something, especially in a digital world, from somewhere on the internet and presenting it to your audience. It does two things. It saves them looking for it and at the same time by you sharing it, it's giving it your seal of approval. So you're saying, you know, this topic was on point, this is accurate, you can digest this information and it's relevant to you. So I think if you're starting out online, by creating content, commenting on others' content, and then just bringing in information that you've read from elsewhere online, you can really kind of start to open those channels and develop your following or, or create your conversations with your patients. So was engaging in patients online something that you were trained in or something that just came naturally? No, <laughs> I've never <laughs> been trained in being online. Everything's self-taught and YouTube's a fantastic tool, so anyone <laughs> can use that and go with it. Uh, again, I guess that boils back to why I used Carl Robinson in the first place, because I was entering the unknown. I hadn't had any training. I was protecting myself to some extent. Uh, had the training been available, then I would have appreciated some and it would have made the process a little more seamless. Yeah. Uh, did you think the use of the pseudonym was a reflection of how the industry views online engagement? Absolutely. We, to be honest with you, when I returned to work, obviously I wasn't doing this full time and I'm still not, the response from my peers was very varied. So you have those positive people that uh, you know come and go in your life and they're great because they're like what you're doing is incredible good luck to you and you have the people that actually you know those people that change is never a good thing it's always quite daunting and they I guess were a bit resentful uh, especially maybe my management who <laughs> thought all of a sudden you know we've got one of our healthcare professionals out there does what he says reflect on the company I work for the NHS and again that was another kind of reason why Carl Robinson came about because it meant that people that I was working with wouldn't have to worry about what I was saying online because it would never really come back to the NHS and it wouldn't be considered their thoughts. You know on Twitter when people say yeah. you know, thoughts are my own and not a reflection of this company that I work for, um, Carl Robinson gave me an extra uh, level to be able to do that. Out of interest have you ever had any guidelines from the NHS? No, no. So it's quite interesting you say that because I, obviously being an advocate of this kind of thing, uh, where I used to work at the Royal Surrey County Hospital in Guildford, I was putting together the standard operating procedures for having your department online. So using Facebook, Twitter and social media uh, as a way to interact with your patients. You know, it's really great. So I think it's really nice actually that departments are starting to have a social media um, channel 
to discuss different things with their patients because it's not only nice but it's efficient as well and effective and a good way to reach the masses. And we also know that patients enjoy being part of a community so it's always nice for our patients, especially younger ones who've got a pacemaker, to find other younger patients with a pacemaker because it's not something that one of their friends are necessarily going to have. Mm -hmm. And by having an online community, people have the option of joining in or the option of not joining in, so it doesn't really matter. But if they do want to meet others who are similar to themselves, it gives them a nice kind of platform to do that. So with the impact that having an online presence has had for your own career and also the positive impact it's had on your patients, is training uh, to speak to patients online something that you would advocate for your peers? So training, if it was available, yes, I don't think there's many uh, options for people to have training online. I guess just more positive reinforcement that there's a way to conduct yourself online that isn't going to be detrimental to your career, isn't going to... Um, you know, jeopardise your professional credibility. In actual fact, it will enhance it and you will get opportunities. Uh, you'll be able to protect yourself online. So at the moment, there's actually websites cropping up all over the place. Iwantgreatcare.org, uh, RateMDs, who's an American one, I believe, and also on NHS Choices, where patients are given the opportunity to review doctors, healthcare centres and everything like that. So with that culture starting to kind of flourish and the star system that we all see on TripAdvisor or eBay, um, you know, with feedback, it's something that people online are very familiar with. And that is happening, whether we like it or not, for doctors and healthcare centres. So not only would I recommend that people are encouraged and training to do it would be great to get online but I think really we have to get online now to protect ourselves and to be able to voice our opinions or voice our thoughts. So can you talk through some of the opportunities that have come about as a result of your website? Yes and it's actually immediately a difficult question because I start thinking of all the opportunities <laughs> and trying to like um, put them in some kind of time order. I guess the first nice one that I had was the opportunity to write for Gooch News, who are grown-ups with congenital uh, heart disease, and it's a charity publication, and I got to write for them um, all about pacemakers, and it was quite nice to have your first kind of article in a publication, and that was the first opportunity that really presented itself. From there, it snowballed, so I've now had the opportunity to work as an educator with the largest devices company in the world, so I regularly um, lecture for them. I also have filmed uh, a series of pacemaker videos in Austria. Uh, with regards to publishing, <laughs> I've also had, I've put some books out there. Now the book started as content marketing, which essentially is just giving people nice um, digestible information for free, uh, just for visiting your website or being a part of your community. And they were well received and I thought, well, maybe I could market these. So I put them onto different channels and people started to buy the books and I thought, well, you know, this is great and they're reaching the right people and people must be enjoying the content as well. And off the back of that, I was um, essentially approached by two publishers, almost at the same time for one of the books, um, Pacemakers Made Easy. And we were in talks about publishing that book. Now. I mean, to have a book published in your field is normally a very difficult thing to achieve. But actually, it was presenting itself to me all of a sudden, just because um, I was online. And in October, you're going to be talking at HRC. Can you talk about that a little bit more? Yes. So HRC is essentially the largest um, conference, cardiology conference in the UK. And every year they talk uh, about a whole range of topics. There's a patient day on the Sunday, and then on the Monday and the Tuesday, there's days just for healthcare professionals, obviously sharing their experiences, um, you know, people delivering talks who are held in high regard in the cardiology world. And as a result of being online, I've been invited to talk there with regards to uh, online presence and whether or not uh, health centres should have a social media channel or their own website or should be reaching out to their patients um, through uh, online mechanisms or online channels. So I'm really looking forward to that obviously and it's a, it's a, a real privilege and an honour. I'm one of three now people on the board of Allied Professionals for HRC. I'm the most junior. Um, from a professional point of view that's probably the biggest and most exciting opportunity I've had uh, off the back of my 
uh, website, which is essentially what it all boils down to. So you mentioned the Med Mastery uh, videos. Can you tell me a little bit more about those? Yeah, so Med Mastery are a company and they're aiming videos, tutorials, at medical professionals. And they are validating that the person giving the video is an expert. And the whole premise behind it is information in bite-sized chunks. So again, we are focused on the immediacy of how people want their information. So with this in mind, would you say there's a high demand for short, snappy videos of medical information, not just for patients, but for professionals as well? Yes, absolutely. It's indicative of the world that we live in now is that we want information. We want it now and we want it quickly. We, we don't wait for anything anymore. You know, we don't have to go to a library and sort through a lot of books to find our answer. We should be able to go on Google, go on a search engine and find it straight away. Not only do we want the information, but we want it quickly and we want someone to have taken the time to edit it down to take the care to make sure that it's accurate information and then spoon feed it to us, which is great because there's loads of mediums that can do that online. If you want evidence of this, you have to look no further than YouTube, where if you click on any YouTube video and click on a little, little settings button, it will pull up a speed feature and you can actually speed up the video. So not only are we having the videos now, but we want to process the information even quicker. YouTube has recognised this and given us a feature where we can really speed the information up. You know, the human brain's incredible. We can take on information far quicker than we do in everyday life, and we can train ourselves to take on information really quickly. It's something that we're getting used to with this online world, and again, like I say, a company like YouTube or many other companies have given a speed-up function so that we can have that information delivered even quicker to us.